Good morning, everybody. I'm Bora Dar. Um, thank you for inviting me um, to this event today to talk about my research. Um, as Catherine's mentioned, my title's Electrifying Wellbeing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a study that I've been involved with my colleague Ben Spencer over there um, for the last three years, looking at older people and cycling. So it's an area we feel that has been neglected with very much a focus on, on younger people and safe routes to school, as important though that is. We felt that um, the older population was, um, was, had been neglecting and talking around active travel, and particularly in relation to cycling. Um, the electric aspect will become apparent as I, as I talk through the research. So as the Minister has highlighted, we've got very low level of cycling amongst older people in the UK, very low level of cycling per se, but particularly amongst the older population and none more so than in Wales. Um, so you can see from the chart, effectively, from the age of 40 to 49, kind of got 2% journeys by bike, and that reduces through the, for the deciles, 50 to 59, 1.2, 60 to 69, 1%, and then obviously by 70, uh, you, you're dipping below the 1% of all journeys. So a very, very low rate of cycling. You could say that older people on bikes are an endangered species, uh, and it's obviously always very interesting to look at endangered species. Um, so that's what we did. We wanted to look at that. We also looked at the story elsewhere. So you won't be surprised to hear that the Netherlands, that the share of journeys by people aged 65 and over, 23% of them are by bicycle. In Denmark, it's 15%. But let's choose Germany, because that's probably more comparable, not so flat, 9%. So nine times more older people cycle than in the UK. So why is this? Well, we looked at the secondary data. There are things from the social trends that suggest that um, it's confidence riding in the, in the British transport situation, the transport system, so lack of confidence riding on the roads, and also capabilities. Obviously, there's more challenges for the ageing body um, as people get older, and obviously uh, the mind as well. We do hear, from, obviously, from public health. I'm an urban planner, but we hear from public health colleagues that there are great benefits to be had for physical activity in older age. As there's a, a bigger payback, arguably, than when you're younger and carefree. So we wanted to kind of look at, if you like, cycling, to understand cycling amongst the older population in the UK and to look at how this affects people's independence, health and well-being. And then obviously following on from that, not just to understand it and say, well, this is the picture, to actually put forward recommendations to how we could try and get the levels that we see in Germany and, heaven forbid, um, the Netherlands and Denmark. Okay, so we focused on four cities, Cardiff being one of them. Um, there was four universities involved, myself and Ben, and colleagues at Oxford Brooks, but also colleagues in Cardiff, in planning in Cardiff, in UW at Bristol, and also at Reading Universities. And we involved 240 people aged. Initially, we were going to go for people 60 plus, but we also introduced a cohort of 50 to 59. Um, approaching that kind of retirement period, or, although that's extending, isn't it? So that's arguable. Um, so those four sites, the universities are based there, granted, but we felt that that gives, gave us diversity in terms of planning and demographic in those four cities. Um, and also for practicalities, we use very immersive methods. So starting from kind of secondary policy reviews to begin with to understand how um, cycling has been talked about in policy documents over the, over the years, from the 70s onwards. You know, initially it was all about energy conservation in the 70s. Um, then it was all about kind of road safety. And then public health in the 80s only started to become uh, salient in discourses around why we should promote cycling. We looked at trends, existing trends from the data that's available already. We did some study visits in two cities, Seville in southern Spain, Andalusia, and Munich in Germany, so northern European, southern European um, examples of where cycling has phenomenally grown in the last few decades, and in fact the last decade in the case of Seville. We wanted to understand why has that happened, why is it that demogra demographic is more diverse than the kind of young London fixie hipsters that we have in, in the UK, how have they managed to, to um, diversify the population cycling? Um, sorry, oh yeah, and also we did empirical studies, so very immersive studies with people, so biographical interviews, sitting down and talking to people about cycling over their life course from childhood to present day to understand when cycling dropped in and dropped out of their lives and the reasons why. We also um, shadowed some riders, so a technique using sociology and anthropology of 
following people, just observing them, questioning taken for granted behaviours, to look at their kind of practices around cycling and the experiences they had while riding a bike around the city. And we also did a cycling and wellbeing trial, and that was taking new or returning cyclists back to cycling and researching that experience over time and measuring the effect on on physical activity and well-being. So what I'm going to focus on today is more on the cycling and well-being trial, because obviously I haven't got time to go through the whole project. Um, as I said, we, we focused on people who'd stopped cycling, who were already cycling, the minority, if you like, the endangered species, and those who were keen to restart cycling. All of them did a life history interview. Obviously, those stopped, took no further part in the study. Those are already cycling. We did the observations and interviews with them and the restarting of the cycling and wellbeing trial. So we got around 200, 236 um, participants, um, roughly 52% male, 48% female, um, average age 63. So, you know, quite a nice balance. Um, we, we came up with three cycling trajectories, if you like, and these are kind of idealised patterns of of cycling in the life course. So reluctant riders, who we call reluctant riders, people who hadn't cycled in the last five years or, or, or beyond that, um, typically rode in childhood, but then you know, there's been a big hiatus for, for multiple reasons why they stopped. Resilient riders, obviously able to carry cycling consistently um, through, through the life course and uh, have managed to cycle in the last five years. And then the re-engaged riders that I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, this morning. All of this documented in, in a report which is available on our website, which I'll give you a link to at the end. And that gives a little bit more detail, for example, on the resilient riders on the mobile rides we did with them, none more so than in Cardiff, which you can see um, um, illustrated there. So we've got some sort of cartoons of how people negotiate through space and the effects on their, on their kind of psychosocial stress, if you like, as they ride. So for the re-engaged riders, the people taking part in our trial, we're interested in sort of two questions, really. So how do specific features of the built environment and assistive technology, that's e-bikes and equipment, um, affect cycling experience? And what is, their Im what is the impact on well-being? So looking at how they interact effectively with the built environment. Um, how does this affect um, cognitive function, well-being, and physical health? So those were our driving questions. So we had 36 pedal cyclists, people who signed up uh, to take part in the trial and agreed to ride a pedal bike, 38 who were given an e-bike, a rally e-bike to use, and 22 people who promised us they would do no cycling through, through the period as our control group. It was mainly in the Oxford and Reading locations, um, so two different cities. began, as I said, with a life history interview. We then had to do an assessment with the riders to, um, you know, to assure us, if you like, and the university through the ethics that those people were not just going to launch them into traffic. So they did an assessment with local training providers just to check they're okay and to brush up on their skills. They then took part in some psychological tests with colleagues in neuroscience at, at Reading University. And then they were let loose, effectively, for eight weeks to use the bikes. And all we asked of them was to ride three times for 30 minutes a week and to keep a diary of that experience. And then to come back after the, the trial and to repeat those tests so we can do pre- and post-test um, analysis. We also did a focus group at Brooks to bring everybody together to share those experiences. And we did an exit survey several months down the line just to see what happened next after the bikes were given in. You know, did people just go back to their regular lives or did they take up cycling? So what were the reasons people took part? I mean, that was interesting in itself. People stepping up saying, I need to do something about my health or I want to get back into cycling, reconnect with it, or my partner cycles and I'd like to ride with them. There were multiple reasons, but essentially it was seen as an opportunity, almost a rehabilitation for ageing well, physical activity. That was uppermost in the minds of the participants of having to do something, and cycling offered that, that mechanism for doing so. Um, general like, dispositions, really, lacking confidence. Will I be able to do it? Um, what about the safety aspects? And what about the challenge of kind of relearning? Have I forgotten? Because it, often it's something that people have done many, many years ago. So as I said, we did an assessment with our bicycle cooperative in Oxford. In the Oxford case, Reading, we had another provider. People did a, an assessment. After that, they did their, their cognitive tests with my colleagues um, from Reading. And then they were issued with a diary, which collected facts about their journeys, where they went, what time, how far, that sort of thing, the purpose. And also to record their feelings. So I wanted them to um, 
use pictures, drawings, words, however they wanted to illustrate their experience through that eight-week period. So what do we find out from doing that? So from the diaries, obviously it gave us a very rich source of information. Um, it allowed us to really kind of see into the life world of, of the um, participants. But things that leapt out from the diaries, from the facts and the, the feelings, if you like, is that the bikes are mainly used for recreation, so mainly in green spaces or away from the urban domain as, as we know it, if you like, the roads and the busy traffic streets. Um, often in the company of others, so social support, very important. Often people would um, recce journeys before they went out and discover new geographies that they weren't aware of, like alleys or links to different um, green spaces or riverside paths, for example. And what we saw is over the course of the diaries, increased confidence. People having much more effects and control over what they were doing in terms of going places and extending those journeys, doing things alone. So that was definitely something that leapt out of the diaries. And in some cases, more functional journeys, people moving from recreation to using the bike, for example, to go to the local shops to do shopping. So as Colleen says in Oxford, I ventured further afield this week and used the bike as an alternative to the car. I've been mostly staying in the local area on the bike and using it for errands where I would have possibly have used the car in the past. So, you know, some um, indications that people are also forfeiting um, private motorised transport. Um, in terms of, like, the reported benefits, like the effect, if you like, um, on, on mind and body, people talk very much about weight loss, like great pleasure in terms of how much they weighed, and some people were even recording it, and get, gave you the end result in the diary, such as Patrick here in Reading. Um, Fun and fitness, people talk very much about that kind of novelty of getting back on the bike, particularly in the case of, of the e-bikes. Increased leg strength, obviously anecdotes from people, they didn't have the scientific measures, but they were saying, my legs feel stronger, I feel I'm able to stand up out of the chair much easier. Endurance, being able to keep going, uh, much more resilient. Better sleep came up a lot, that was quite interesting. Obviously people were suddenly doing quite vigorous activity on a bike, <laughs> you know, out like a light in the, during the evenings. We've got a lovely video of one of our participants talking about that. Um, sense of achievement, that came up a lot in the narratives. People feeling like, wow, I actually cycled to this place. I never imagined I'd be able to do that in the past. Um, and improved self-esteem. So what were the challenges then? Traffic infrastructure, um, design and maintenance, really. Those were, you know, when people weren't critical in the diaries, but, um, the, you know, there would always be an add-on of, like, I had this issue, interaction, or the conditions are pretty poor. I think it really shocked people that what's laid out before them is, is so poor, um, particularly if they've got experience of driving and, you know, you expect road signs, you expect a good surface, you expect all those things on a bike. It's, you know, that came to the fore for them and they, and they wrote about it. Legibility, really, what knowing what to do in certain circumstances. So really nice annotations of, well, I think I had to do this, but then I did that, then I realized I should have done the other. So people trying to work out um, route planning. As I said, stop, start riding, another bugbear for people. That, that inability to maintain momentum, so having to start, stop, particularly difficult for people with hip and joint problems, of having to really push off again when they've been stopped, for example, at a series of traffic lights. The paraphernalia, people complained about, they didn't realize all the gizmos you had to carry around cycling, lights, gloves, jacket, helmet in some cases, D-locks, and when you go shopping, having to deal with all of that. So, you know, cycling not so simple after all. There is planning to be done and things to carry. Weather, I'll say no more about that. Um, pretty obvious one. And storage and parking. So what to do at the end destination and also in the home was an issue. Um, pertinent to e-bikes, the e-bike trials, was the weight and maneuverability of the bikes. So whilst people really embraced the technology, they're also very critical of the weight particularly when the bike's stationary or parking it or moving it in the house across the threshold, that difficulty of kind of slowly moving it around. Um, the operation of it really, little, there were little glitches with the bikes that we did use, to do with keys and charging and remembering to charge, that sort of thing. Also, the social dimension was quite interesting. People wrote about um, comments they'd received from work colleagues um, or out, even out in the public you know, about this idea that they're cheating on an e-bike, that it's not actually cycling or it's not exercise. Uh, most people shrugged it off, but they highlighted it in the diary as, you know, feeling that kind of social perception that they're not really um, riding a bike in a puritanical sense. 
And then issues around cost and security. People are a bit fearful about leaving electric bikes in public places because of the, you know, the consciousness of the expense of those bikes. I'm not going to read the quotes, but I, you know, these slides will be available. You can get a sense of, and also in the report, a sense of what people um, illustrated about that. So overall, from the data, we, we've got an average of three hours per week, so 180 minutes a week of engagement with the bike. Yes, albeit on a program, but nevertheless, um, people are, you know, in the most part, in, embrace the, the, um, the task ahead of them. Um, an average of 30 separate journeys over an eight-week period. As, as I said, the majority of those are recreation or some sort of what we might call personal business, um, and not particularly utility, not for going to work or, or um, you know, kind of functional journeys. Um, Two-thirds of participants perceive that their well-being had improved. We asked them kind of on a basic scale um, compared to before taking part in the trial. And, um, you know, we also found out from the exit survey that about two-thirds had continued to cycle and a further 27% were saying that they're going to do it in the future. And that was around seasonality, really. So there were a lot of fair weather cyclists. But the interesting thing is a lot of people had gone out and bought equipment and indeed 19 people went out and bought an e-bike after the trial. I said, right, we're so won over by the e-bike, absolutely need one. We did do it for them at cost through our link with Rally, so that's obviously a huge incentive. But nevertheless, 19 people committed and paid the money to, to purchase one. And 12 purchased the pedal cycle. So, you know, it's the proof in the pudding. Um, so, well-being and cognitive process. I don't want to dwell too much on the data because we've got a whole data set to explore on this, uh, which we will publish um, in the next few months. But on the whole, pedal cycle and e-bike users reported increased well-being compared to the controls. Um, and the questionnaire measuring mental health, the short form 36, showed marked improvement and was stronger for e-bike than pedal cyclists. And I think that really corroborates the qualitative information that we got from the diaries, the sheer pleasure of riding the e-bike and the sheer joy that that took out, out of the effort and the challenge of riding a pedal cycle um, in older age. And the effects on cognition weren't so quite so clear cut, cut but cycle lists tended to outperform controls on a number of the tasks that we asked people to do. The, the classic one is spatial reasoning. Spatial reasoning, the cyclists really, really outperform the controls, and e-bikers in particular outperform the pedal cyclists in terms of their ability to reason space through the tests we, we did. Um, we, we, we are arguing the effects are not just due to physical exercise, but also engagement with outdoor settings. So that was very strong in the quality of research where people talked about what we might call honeypots, people, places people went to and discovered by bike and enjoyed by bike or shared those moments with other people or animals or nature. That was very, very strong in the, in the, in the quality of research element. Um, yeah, it's an elaboration. So... Arguably, there is potential to engage a significant market of what we might call re-engaged re or re-engaging riders, because they do place importance on staying active. Um, cycling fits with that idea of pursuit of active aging project. Um, however, there's a huge caveat in that. A lot of our participants talked about only specific domains that they would entertain the idea of cycling in. So I, I, one could imagine in Cardiff, for example, Butte Park would be a, a classic one and the Taft Trail and the Bay Area. Um, so positive experience overhaul when they have control over their own cycling activity. So when they feel they've got control over the situation of where they're going, what times, who with, etc., really, really positive effect. And then, as I said, with the indicators, we've got evidence of benefits to well-being when part of a structured plan to support cycling. Um, I think, as an aside on that, I would say that we'd underestimated the structured plan in a sense. We thought we were setting up the research, we'd stand back, and off they would go. But actually through Ben and my other colleague at Brooks and colleagues at Reading, there was a lot of pastoral care, actually, and support system. It was almost like we were setting up kind of a specific health program that really helped people and motivated them, although we didn't do any motivational exercises. The very fact we had this framework seemed to support their activities. Um, so overall, cycling is partial and what we call precarious. You know, it's difficult to know whether that will will last into the future, although there's indications that it will. Obviously, it's very precarious and given the, the unsupportive environment. So positive response among um, cyclists, but particularly e-bike tri trialists. Um, 
we think that the independent mobility elements and getting outdoors through the qualitative narrative is very strong and that, that is really an incentive to get on a bike and get outdoors and discover new areas and interact with people and nature. And again, the e-bike component in particular came up very strong in the research. People really embraced that. So we've made a few recommendations from that in the report. And I've just, uh, I'll just give you an overview of how we've done that and then just pick out a couple, just to give you an idea. So we very much aligned with the Global Age Friendly Cities Guide. We had a look at that, the World Health Organization Guide um, from the early noughties, and thought, well, what, what does this guide say generally about um, the spatial domain, about cities and um, older people? And what does it say in particular about walking and cycling? So we've, we followed the eight domains, outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, housing, social participation, respect and social inclusion, civic participation and employment, communication and information, and finally community support and health services. We took those eight domains and we said, how does our research fit into those domains? And then tried to come up with recommendations from that. And we produced a series of briefing notes as well as the reports. We appreciate ministers don't have time to read 62 page reports. These are just A3 fold outs. Um, and they've, they also have got a target audience. So we've got one for health promoters, one for planners, engineers and designers and one for the cycle industry, particularly around e-biking. There's a bit of a cognitive distance, if I could say that, around e-bikes, of whether they are something that should be promoted. So, and we say from this research strongly, they absolutely should be supported with this particular market. Um, we, we feel that the best positive benefits of e-biking, the fun, the freedom, and the ability to access the outdoors should be promoted, and how this can contribute not just to physical health, but also to mental health because there is a lot of focus on PA, but there's the mental dimension and um, you know, breaking down isolation. Tackling the general misperception that e-biking is cheating, that a lot of people thought that you didn't have to pedal, you just sat on the bike and twisted and you went, but actually you do have to pedal and you get assistance. So tackling that general misperception. Um, encouraging retailers to stock e-bikes. So we had lots of, and, and to talk and train their staff in dealing with customers that are potentially interested. Because we did have lots of accounts from people that inquired at local bike shops and you know, almost got laughed out of the shop. So there is a real culture change there in the retail industry required. Um, so we're on a parity with our Northern European neighbors and how they think about e-bikes. Uh, working with, obviously with the government to improve affordability through tax saving. So you're probably aware of the cycle to work scheme has got an upper limit. Perhaps there could be a dual one for e-bike purchases to allow for that extra um, uplift in price. Working partnership with training providers, there's actually no bespoke e-bike training out there at the moment. I'm aware that some has been developed in Brighton, but on a national level, there's no training. And obviously, with that huge interest, that growth across Europe and that lag in Britain, we really need in Wales. And particularly, we need to think about how do we equip people to use these things if they want that support. Also, tryout events. So I was visiting Groningen, Groningen in the north of Netherlands two years ago, and they were doing tryout events in the market square, different bikes for people to test so they could think about it before they committed to a particular brand or type of bicycle. Working with public transport operators and even motor vehicle manufacturers to think about solutions for bikes with other modes of transport. So we don't have to look purist on this thing, bike for everything. Of course, the bike has got limitations when journey distance extends. Um, particularly for pedal cycles, but looking at the solutions there for on-bike carriage. So our participants are really keen on getting the e-bike onto a car and going further afield, but being able to do that because of the weight of the bike. So solutions around that. Reducing the weight of the bikes, obviously, that will come with time and technological advances. Um, offering a wide variety of size and design to suit different people. Obviously, the market's quite limited at the moment, but that's expanding at a hell of a rate, and including low-carrying bikes, bikes for parents, etc., etc., tricycles, uh, list goes on. So that, that will only expand, but obviously needs support. Um, ensuring the operation of e-bikes is straightforward. So again, it doesn't have to be technologically sophisticated or complicated. Our participants love the beauty of on or off and you know having a little bit more power assistant. It doesn't need graduations. It just needs to be as simple as is possible. Think of it in terms of mobile phones, the ones that people tend to like, the ones that are dead easy to use and are intuitive, not the complicated ones. Same with e-bikes. Um, providing optional features that, you know, the, the car market's interestingly is progressing at a massive rate, driverless cars and all the onboard technologies, um, almost becoming a computer on wheels. 
the, you know, the bicycle market is lagging behind that, and there's huge potential there for thinking about the comfort elements of bicycles. How about hand grips that heat up on a, a morning like this to create warm hands on the journey to work, rather than having to have masses of gloves, etc. So the industry needs to think a little bit more about that comfort and cycling effect on the, on the embodied experience of cycling. And then encouraging the government to monitor use of e-bikes in the National Travel Survey. So some, some work I did with some Dutch researchers um, on e-bike use in the Netherlands, and I was astounded that the Dutch government measure the proportion of journeys by e-bike. So when people fill in their surveys, they have to indicate um, how much of that was by e-bikes. They've got a national um, picture, and that suggests that a third of all distance travelled by bike in the Netherlands is by e-bike. It's a massively growing market, particularly amongst the older population. So we feel that the government in the, in the UK needs to, and Wales needs to move into that mode of, of taking this seriously and monitoring it to allow it to um, you know, move forward with its policies and programmes. I probably haven't done the data justice because there is a hell of a lot of data, so please do go onto the Cycle Boom website, www.cycleboom.org, to get the report. And I've brought some briefing notes today which we can leave um, for you. But We've also got videos of 12 participants that took part in the study that agreed to be videoed and to share their story. Um, and, I, and as I say, they you know much better than me trying to explain to you those effective dimensions of, of cycling and e-bike in particular. So please do, if you just only watch one, um, Joe's is a good one to watch. She's very expressionate about how it made her feel, what, what she did during the trial. Um, and please use as you wish for your activities. So the website is www.cycleboom.org where you can get electronic documents, the report and the briefing notes and the videos or if you want hard copies just get in touch with myself or Ben Spence and we happily send those out to you. So thank you very much. <laughs>